Hello everyone, Sula here with another big adventure. In this episode, I'm going to be comparing various ways of photographing in GC7000, the North America Nebula. I was disappointed in the results of my picture that I took for my demonstration of how to process a deep sky object. And so I wanted to take some more pictures of it with various equipment and then compare the results. So in the demonstration, I used an 80 millimeter apochromatic refractor guided. I only took 20 pictures of two minutes each in a Bortle 4. Tonight, I'm in a Bortle 3. I'm not taking any pictures with this. Like I said, I like to stargaze while I'm taking pictures. And so this is for stargazing. I have a 115 millimeter apochromatic refractor that I will be taking guided pictures with. I'm not sure how long each exposure will be, but I will take more than 20 pictures. I just didn't take enough pictures, I think, in the first time. And with my big six inch refractor, apochromatic, I'm going to be taking pictures with it, but honestly, the North American Nebula doesn't actually fit inside of it, but I'm going to use a modified camera and that will bring out a lot more of the nebulosity so that picture will be a lot redder and i only have one modified camera so the other two examples are i'll see after i process them and we'll see what the results are of these various methods um, these will both be guided as well and i'm going to take another one unguided with the red cat 51 it's unguided because I don't have the attachment to attach a guide scope to it or even a finder scope. So I'll be back after it gets dark and we'll get going with this project and then we'll go over the results. I'm going to be photographing the North America Nebula NGC 7000 in Cygnus the Swan. NGC 7000, also known as Caldwell 20, is a very large emission nebula found near Deneb, the brightest star in Cygnus the Swan. Deneb is an Arabic word that means tail, and indeed it is the tail of the swan. And next to it is where you'll find the North American Nebula. It's magnitude 4, and it has an apparent dimension of 120 by 100 arc minutes, so very large. I photographed it before in my episode about taking deep sky images and processing them in Photoshop, but the picture was not very good. I was not happy with it. And so I'm going to photograph it again tonight. There are some major differences between the first time I took it and tonight. The first time I took it for my demonstration, I was using an 80 millimeter refractor on a, a EQG mount and I was using a regular uh, APS-C camera, and I was in a Bortle 4, and it was very humid that night, and there was dew. And I didn't think the picture turned out very well, I think primarily because of the light pollution. So tonight, I'm going to photograph it here in Dark Skies Forever, Montana, which is a Bortle 3 for now, and major difference, I'm going to be using this William Optics Red Cat 51, which has a 51 millimeter aperture, 250 millimeter focal length, so it's a smaller telescope. And I'm going to be using my Sony A6000, which is a modified camera. I have removed the IR filter from this camera, so it's going to pick up a lot more of the red in the nebula, because it's an emission nebula. And it's very large, so it'll fit within this smaller telescope. And the other big difference is <laughs> I don't have anywhere to put an auto guider. And the auto guider is bigger than this telescope, so I'm not going to be auto guiding. So those are the major differences. I think the biggest one is going to be the fact that I'm at a Bortle 3. I am using a different mount. This is a, a better mount. This is a Skywatcher EQ6R Pro. They're, it's pretty comparable to the Orion Sirius EQG mount. So I'm going to um, set it up now. The sun just went down and uh, 
I'm only going to one star line because I don't even have a finder's coat to put on this thing. And uh, then I will uh, process it in Photoshop, just like I did with the other pictures I took at the Bortle 4. I just wanted to add that that ugly white thing behind me in the last scene is my roof. The tree fell on it in June and it's October and they still have not repaired it. <laughs> and that is the roof, so sorry about the mess. Okay, I have the 115 millimeter Eon triplet going. I have it set up to take 30 pictures of three minutes each, but um, the moon's gonna come up in, I don't know, an hour. So I don't think I can get to 30. No, I can't get to 30. Um, so I'll just take as many as I can. And I put the modified camera on there, so it's gonna look better anyway. So I'll see how that one turns out and I will take pictures with the other one, the 150 millimeter, but like I said, <laughs> it's not gonna fit in, the, in that <laughs> telescope. Okay, I finished taking my pictures. I think I got 20 pictures with the 115 millimeter refractor. Uh, the moon is coming up now and it's really impacting the conditions. So I'm gonna stop there. They were three minutes each, and I think I got 20 pictures. And then with my 150 millimeter refractor, I took some pictures. That is with a stock camera. The 115 millimeter had a modified camera, so it's going to be a lot redder and show a lot more nebulosity. But I'll go process them and compare them, and we'll see how they compare. Okay, I finished taking my two sets of photos of NGC 7000, a North American nebula in Cygnus. One was taken in a Bortle 4 with a stock Sony camera, APS-C crop sensor with an 80 millimeter refractor, and it was auto guided. The second set was taken with a modified camera, very similar to both APS-C cameras, except the modified camera which is this one, I have removed the IR filter. In front of all sensors is an IR cut filter that prevents your pictures from being too red. And I had it removed from this camera. I don't know if you can see that. And that's what I meant when I said modified camera. So the pictures I took in the Bortle 3 site, which is here, were with a modified camera on a 51 millimeter refractor, this Red Cat 51. And I did not guide with the Red Cat because I don't have the bracket to put an auto guider on or even a, a finder scope. So I had to go with a one star alignment. And I didn't auto guide, but it was on a, a really nice mount that tracks well the EQ6R Pro. Looks like it's a beautiful evening for stargazing. I have three telescopes set up because I have to do one more session of photographing because my laptop died last night because it was so cold. Um, it's warmer today. But I also have my 12-inch telescope out because there is a transit of IO at 8 o'clock that I want to look at and maybe try to film it also. So. I've got three different telescopes out here. I'm going to try one more time to photograph in GC 7000, and then I'm going to compare my pictures of the various ways I've photographed it. Check out my Mel Maz. I hope you can see that. My Mel is 9 arc minutes and 57 seconds, but my Maz is 0000. zero, 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 zero. <laughs>
I'll just tell you my opinion is that taking the picture in the Bortle 3 made all the difference. I don't have a light pollution filter, so I couldn't do anything about the light pollution in the Bortle 4, but my impression is that there's a huge difference between a Bortle 3 and a Bortle 4. A Bortle 3, you can see the Milky Way so well. I can see Andromeda, M31, naked eye. I can see the Hercules cluster, naked eye. Lots and lots of Messier objects are naked eye in a Bortle 3. And um, it's just way better than a Bortle 4. Granted, the Bortle 4 that I went to, uh, not only was it light polluted, it was close to the coast, so there was a lot of humidity and dew and that may have had something to do with it, but there's no getting around it. It's near a heavily populated area where I went and light polluted. And there's just an enormous difference between Bortle 3 and Bortle 4 in the outcome of my photos. In my opinion, it could be many factors, the different size telescope, the fact that one was guided and one wasn't, the fact that one camera was modified and caught a lot more of the red and an emission nebula which is what a modified camera is for but my personal opinion is that being in a dark sky site is the number one factor in getting better photos and a better experience stargazing it's well worth it to go find a dark sky site and fight to preserve dark skies because it just makes stargazing so much better it's good and you can see things and Bortle 4 and worse in light polluted areas, but it's just way better in a dark sky site. Definitely worth it to get out there and find a dark sky site for your photos and your visual observing. So I hope you enjoyed this brief episode about my comparison between my photos of the North American Nebula. That's it for now. I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, I hope there will always be dark skies forever and that you're able to access them.